Uh, I want to share with you guys a story this morning uh, that happened a few years back. Uh, having, how many of you guys have ever been on a mission trip before? Been on a mission trip somewhere? Okay. What about, how, how many of you guys have been to London? Anybody been to London, England? Okay. It's a pretty cool city, isn't it? It's awesome. It's beautiful. Uh, there's a lot of different cultures represented there, and uh, I had a lot of fun there. We, years ago, took a mission trip uh, when I was a, a youth leader at my youth group back in Kansas City. We took a mission trip there, and we took 40 teenagers to London, right? And uh, that was an interesting experience. Um, but it was awesome. It ended up being great. Uh, but they have a saying there in London. It's called, mind the gap. And, uh, and it's on like all their touristy stuff. And it's on the logo that represents their subway, like their underground. And so uh, the reason why they have this is because at, in the subway, when you're down there, there's a platform and you have the train and there's a gap between the platform and the train. And on the floor, it says, mind the gap. So you don't fall in there and get your leg chopped off and die a slow and painful death. You know, so very courteous of them. So glad that they did that. Um, so, but it's kind of a cultural thing as well with a lot of the people there. A lot of the people in London are very personal, private, um, introverted people, and they, they have a bubble, okay? They have a personal bubble. If you pop the bubble, you're in trouble. <laughs> pop the bubble, you're in trouble. That's funny. Anyways, um, so uh, when you step on the subway train in London, it is dead silent. I mean, completely quiet. And it's full of people. And they're all just in the bubbles. No one's talking to anyone. I mean, you can hear a pin drop. It's crazy. It's like, wow, this is creepy. And so when we would take our group of 40 American teenagers <laughs> onto the subway, the silence would be obliterated, <laughs> completely destroyed. No sign of it anywhere. And so we get on the subway, and it's like, ah, blah, 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 oh, that's so funny. Ah. And it's like super loud. And I'm watching the people on the train, and their faces look like they're in agonizing pain. <laughs> they're like, oh. And they look at us, and like, you know, and you, you can read it on their face what they're thinking. These loud, obnoxious Americans think they can come in here and own this place. And so I'm recognizing this happening. And so I'm talking to the team. I'm like, hey, guys, let, let's, why don't we kind of tone it down, keep it down a little bit? And they're like, what? <laughs> blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, okay. Um, and so over the week, I talked to them, and I was like, listen, guys, we, we're in another culture. We need to respect that culture, honor them, and be polite, um, and, and understand how they live their lives here. And, we're, and we need to represent our nation well. And we need to represent Jesus well. Because remember, we're here to, you know, share the gospel, you know, that whole thing. And so, um, and they're like, oh, yeah, I get it. And so then... For the rest of the week, they did awesome. We ended up having amazing feedback with our group. People telling us, wow, they're so kind, so polite, so respectful, and just really honoring. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. And it's because they were representing our country well. And they're representing Jesus well. And it's the same thing in the kingdom of God. We've come from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. We're a part of a new kingdom now. The Bible says that we are citizens of heaven. And so we are representatives of this new kingdom. And more importantly than that, we are representatives of the king, Jesus. In everything we say, everything we do, our attitudes, our actions, our behavior, our relationships, our goals, our life pursuits, all of it is a reflection upon Christ. In 1 John 2, 6, it says this, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 says, imitate God therefore in everything you do because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love following the example of Christ. And so we are representatives of Jesus. We are representing or presenting again Jesus to this world. And for many of us, we might be the only Jesus that these people see, right? We have to own this as the body of Christ. The question then becomes, 
What Jesus are we showing them? So the title of my message today is represent with an exclamation mark. I'm so white. Anyways, <laughs> represent. So let's pray and let's ask the Holy Spirit to help. Lord Jesus, thank you, God, for today. Holy Spirit, we honor you. You are here. Your presence is in the room. And we honor your presence, God. Lord, we love you. We want to give our hearts to you. Holy Spirit, use me to speak through me today, Lord of God. We want to hear from you directly from your spirit. God, challenge us, transform us. Let your word be powerful in our hearts and in our lives, Father. We give you glory and we honor you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. 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 So how do we represent Jesus to the world? How do we imitate Christ? Because that's what that is, right? Well, Jesus gives us the answer. Isn't that nice of him? He's so great. John 13, it says this, verse 34 and 35. So now I give you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. That word disciple there means disciplined learner. In other words, it will prove to the world that we're followers of Jesus, that we're representing him well. And so it's our love for one another. Love is the answer, which makes sense because the greatest commandment, right? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the Bible says that on this hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, you just focus on these two things and you got it. Love God with everything, love people with everything. So love is the answer. So that begs the questions. Number one, what is love? Because there's a lot of different ideas of love out there. Number two, how do we love? And then number three, who do we love? So what is love? How do we love? And who do we love? You guys ready to jump into this? All right. So question number one, what is love? The world has a lot of different ideas of what love is. Right? And, and just in case you didn't know, the world is always preaching a message. Always. Through movies, television, culture, uh, shopping, uh, you know, relationships, you name it, school. The world is preaching a message. And just like John Bevere was talking about last week, if we are not in a clean air environment where the word of God, we're hearing the message of God's word. If we are not in that environment, then by default, we will adopt the message that culture is preaching to us. And so it's going to be unhealthy. It's going to cause harm. And it's the same thing with love. So Paul talked to Timothy about this. He warned him in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. He said, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will only love themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. Now check out this last verse. They will act religious but they will reject the power that can make them godly. Stay away from people like that. So Paul gives an outline of what the world's idea of love is. And so we're going to talk about four things that love isn't. So what love isn't? Number one, love isn't physical pleasure. Love isn't physical pleasure. Now, it's all in the movies. It's in the TV shows. It's all about, I love you, you know? The first kiss, the holding of the hand, the embrace. It's all the body, you know, right? And it's all physical pleasure. That's what it's all about. And they exalt that and they say, that's it. That's the ultimate expression of love. But man, that is a lie. That is not true. And it's in the word, 1 John chapter 2. Verse 15 and 16, listen to these words. Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. That's strong words. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, 
but are from this world. Can't get any more clear than that. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. So it's not physical pleasure. Number two, it is not infatuation. The, love will the, the world will preach that love is infatuation. It's when you're infatuated with someone or something. It's football. It's a person, girl, a guy, whatever. It's where, man, they, they meet every need. They, they fill the holes in your life. That's not it. That's not true. Because what we do is we put our trust in that person or that thing to give us value and worth. And it won't. Another word for this would be emotional idolatry. It's where we say we put this thing or this person before God because of the way it makes us feel. That's not healthy. That's not good for us. And the reason why we do that is because of insecurities. It's because we don't know who we are in Christ. Because we aren't secure in our identity in Jesus. And so we run to something else. We don't realize the fact that we're already accepted. He's already accepted us. We don't need acceptance from someone else. He's already loved us. He's already pursued us. He's already laid down his life for us. He's died for us. He's given everything to us. He's been ravished by our hearts. He's after us. He cares for us, cares about every detail of, of our life. He keeps track of every tear that we cry in his bottle and he writes down every moment in his book. He is the one that we need and he is our security. We have everything that we need in him. And so the reason why we believe the lie of infatuation is because we aren't secure in who we are in Christ. We, we aren't accepting that truth, that God is all we need. And so we believe the lie that love is infatuation. Number three, now all of these fall into two categories. It's either a perversion of love, like the first two, or it's an incomplete love, an incomplete idea of love. So the next couple are like that. Number three is the give and take. The give and take. Because we give love and we receive love. That's part of loving people. But the give and take is when we say, all right, so uh, I did this for you, this, 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 and this. So you know, <laughs> I expect something in return, you know what I'm saying? Like, don't, don't leave a brother hanging here, you know? Right? And so we keep track of what we gave and then we expect something. Or we love to get something back. That is not biblical love. That's not unconditional Right? I mean, I've heard people say that Jesus would have died if only one person would have come to accept him. But I believe that Jesus would have died if no one would have come and accepted him. Because his love is without conditions. It's not based on our conditions and circumstances. He just gives without expecting return. So it's not give and take number four. It is, now, now this is a tricky one. It is not kindness alone, okay? So kindness is an attribute of love, but kindness by itself is not the complete picture. It's an incomplete picture of love, but the world exalts kindness. Like, oh, look how this guy gave all this money and built this house for somebody. Look at how they did this, and look at how this famous person, you know, emptied their pocketbook for this person, and love, and all we need is love, you know what I mean? And that's like the thing but what they're talking about is kindness. And kindness is great, but it's incomplete. It's not the whole picture. And the thing about kindness is, is it can be a surface thing. So for instance, someone can come up to us and we're like, hey man, hey, how you doing? Have a great day, man. And we're like, I hate that guy. I wanna strangle his neck. Hey man, have a good day. You know, that's, and so it's all, it's all right here. We have no, you know, the heart's not in it. Now, now heart can be in kindness. We can love someone and be kind to someone from our heart. But if we believe the lie that that's the complete expression of love, then we're missing it. Because love is getting down in the trenches. Love is bearing each other's burdens, sharing each other's joys, doing life together. And if we believe the lie that just because we're nice, then we're loving, then we're missing out on the best part of love the community, the support, the engagement. So love isn't kindness alone. It's like a form of godliness, but denying the power. So what is love? What is love? 
John 15, 13, Jesus answers this question. He says, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Love is laying down our life for someone else. It's laying down our life for others. That's what love is. It is living on behalf of someone else, not ourselves. Love is sacrificial. Love costs us something. So picture with me, just close your eyes, and I want you guys to picture Jesus on the cross. He's been beaten beyond recognition, with rods, with whips. He's got the crown of thorns on his head, nails in his wrists and his feet. And people are jeering him and mocking him, and he cries out from the cross, Father, forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. Now open your eyes. How can we look at his example and say love doesn't cost us something? Love requires humility and obedience. Now, I've heard it said that humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Right now, I want you guys to think about this. How often do we think about ourselves? A lot, right? Let's, let's be honest. Some of you guys are probably a lot better at this than I am because you're older and wiser. But we think about ourselves a lot. Right now, how often do we pray about ourselves? How often, how many of our prayers are talking to God about us? Okay. So, and then how many of our goals that we set in our life based on what we want? How often are our pursuits all about what's going to benefit us, right? Now think about what Jesus said. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. So that means we should be thinking about others just as much as we're thinking about ourselves. We should be praying for others just as much as we're praying for ourselves. We should be setting our goals and pursuits in life based just as much on what's going to benefit them as what's going to benefit us. That's what love is. It is a sacrifice. Love is thinking outward. It's living life this way, not this way. That's what love is. It's countercultural, right? You're, you aren't going to hear this message preached in the world, okay? If you're kind, it's so that you can get recognition. If you do something, it's so you can get. It's not, it's not sacrificial, right? So it's outward thinking. And this love has power. You know why? Because the power is in the sacrifice. When we humble ourselves and we say yes to God, we step out of the way and the Holy Spirit has the freedom to operate in power because we've given him room. When we say no to self, that's when we experience true freedom. True love brings true freedom. Just think about it. Think about what life would be like if we never had to think about ourselves. We didn't have to think about what other people were thinking about us. We didn't have to think about how we looked or what we were achieving or how far we were climbing the ladder of success or our performance. We never had to think inwardly. How freeing would that be? Fear, anxiety, doubt, all of that comes from thinking this way. Man, we would be free just to love people and trust that God is going to take care of us as we take care of others. We say, okay, God, I'm putting my life in your hands. You're going to take care of me. You're going to shepherd me. And I'm going to focus my attention this way. Man, that is freedom. That is the yoke that is easy and the burden that is light. Love. Right? Amen? So, what is love? It's laying down our lives for others. Number two, question number two, how do we love? How do we love? So I'm going to apologize in advance for this. Uh, I have a very long list of how we love because if you think about it, you know, love is God, right? God is love. So I have to like describe everything that God is and that would take like a millennia. So I have a list of 15 things and I really do have a list of 15 things. Um, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 13. How many of you guys have heard of 1 Corinthians 13? 
right? The love chapter, right? Love is patient, love is kind. We hear it at a wedding or, you know, graduation or whatever. And a lot of times we take scripture and we think of it as tradition and like poetic. And so we think, oh, that's nice. But we forget the fact that the word of God is a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so 1 Corinthians 13 is a powerful passage of scripture. And it tells us, it paints the picture of what love is. You guys ready? Number one, it is patient. Love is patient with imperfect people. Guess what? Everybody's imperfect. <laughs> so it's patience with everyone. But patience is having a good attitude while we wait. So loving someone is having a good attitude while we wait for God to complete a work within their life. That's loving them. We give them that patience. Ladies, it's having patience with us men who are slow to develop and have many things that we are trying to learn and grow in. So thank you for your patience. Number two, love is active in doing good. There's the kindness piece, active in doing good. Number three, love desires others to get ahead. Because it's non-possessive and non-competitive, love actually rejoices more when someone else succeeds than when we succeed. Now that's different. Someone else does something great and we're like, yeah, that's awesome, man. We do good and we're like, that's cool. Because we're passionate about them, we're living this way, right? Number four, love is self-effacing. It's not ostentatious. So it doesn't need the spotlight. Love will serve behind the scenes willingly and gratefully. Number five, it doesn't treat others arrogantly. Number six, it displays good manners and courtesy. London. Number seven, it doesn't insist on its own rights and demand precedence. There is no sense of entitlement in love. That I deserve this. I did it. This is my rights. I should have this. You know why? Because when we love, we give up our rights. Because we're living for other people. Number eight, love isn't irritable or touchy, rough or hostile, but graceful under pressure. This one is very difficult to do while driving in Denver traffic. <laughs> because when I'm driving in Denver and someone cuts me off, I'm like, oh my goodness, what is wrong with you? Where do you learn to drive? Okay, I get it. Your brain fell out of your head. I mean, that's the only explanation for how you're driving. Your brain fell out. I'm sorry, I'll call the paramedics. You know, it's just, you know, it's so hard, right? But praise God for his grace, right? But he, he can allow us to love even in that situation. Number nine, love doesn't keep an account of wrongs done to it but it erases all resentments. That's hard. It's the list. They did this to me, they did this, they did this, they did this, I can't believe they did this. And then when someone does something wrong again, we pull out the list. Right? And it's this, look at all these things that you've done wrong to me. Love burns the list. It's hard to do. Number 10, love doesn't gossip. It doesn't find satisfaction in the shortcomings of others. Number 11, this is one of my favorites. Love aggressively advertises the good in others. Aggressively advertises the good. Meaning when people are talking bad about somebody, we jump in and we throw the love. Man, but they're awesome, man, because they did this and always aggressively. Listen, one of the greatest things you can do for somebody is talk good about them behind their back. Doesn't that feel great? Like when you hear someone like over saying something nice about you to someone else and you don't, they know that you, they don't know that you're listening. It's like, wow, that's, that makes me feel great. Aggressively advertise the good. Number 12, love defends and holds people up. Comes to their defense when people are attacking. Even if we might agree with them, we come to their defense. Number 13, love believes the best about others, credits them with good intentions, and is not suspicious. Ooh, that's hard. Believe the best, innocent until proven guilty. 
And even if they are proven guilty, we still believe for the best for that person. Number 14, love never gives up on people, but affirms their future. When I was a youth pastor in Kansas City, I had this one youth that, man, I poured my heart out into this guy. He came to know Christ in, in our youth ministry, and we spent three years. I spent three years getting to know him. I would go over his house at 6 a.m. and wake him up, and so we'd spend Jesus time together. And I mean, it was just intense, right? And we had a great relationship, and, uh, and three years just pouring into him. Well, um, one night, he gives me a phone call, and he had been experiencing a lot of depression, a lot of heaviness, a lot of struggle. And he says to me, Neil, I'm done. I can't do this Jesus thing anymore. He's like, I know what you're going to say. Don't call me. Don't text me. I give up. I'm done. And he hangs up the phone. Whew, that was hard. I mean, that broke my heart. I was crying. I'm like, God, I'm like, what's going on? What did I do wrong? Like, all this stuff. And then something rises up in me. And I get angry. I'm like, no, this ain't going to end this way. So I call him back. He answers the phone, praise God. And I'm like, you listen to me. I was like, no matter what you choose to do, you are a man of righteousness. You are chosen by God. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are part of God's special people. And listen, no matter what you choose to do, I'm going to continue to pray for you. And you can give up, but I'm going to continue to fight for you. And whether you like it or not, you're going to be a man of God. And I was just, I was just so like adamant. And so I'm telling him this, and he's like shocked, like, whoa, <laughs> Neil. And so the, the long story short, he ends up continuing to follow Jesus, praise God. And then three or years later, I end up doing his wedding, which was awesome. And uh, on, the, on the bachelor's party that night, we were he was talking about memories. He said, my, my favorite memory of you, Neil, he goes, was that time you called me? And he said, no matter what, whether you like it or not, you're going to be a man of God. He said, I'll never forget that. That's the power of love. That's representing Jesus to this world. It never gives up. And the number 15, love perseveres and remains loyal to the end. So you think, Neil, this is impossible. No one can love like this. You're right. Nobody can. Jesus did. He loved it this way. Bottom line is this. The only way we truly love is through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's when we humble ourselves and we say yes to God. We get out of the way and the Holy Spirit moves in power. There's a story of a Dutch Christian who her family was hiding and rescuing Dutch Jews during the Holocaust. And, uh, and it was in German-occupied Holland. And eventually, the SS found out about their activities. They took their family to prison. The father died two weeks later in prison. The two girls were taken to a notorious concentration camp called Ravensbrück. While they were there, they suffered from starvation and from the brutality and torture of the guards. Her sister died in the camp. She somehow made it through, gets out, stays faithful to her Christian roots, comes back to Holland, starts rehabilitation centers, starts writing books, doing charitable work. She becomes internationally known as an author. And then she's preaching in 1947 in a church in Munich, Germany. And she's preaching on the forgiveness of God and how he forgives us, cleanses us. And Afterwards, the people get up and they start walking out and a man starts walking down the aisle towards her. She doesn't recognize him at first, but as he gets closer, she notices the uniform that he's wearing and the skull and the crossbones. She realizes this was one of the cruelest guards that was at Ravensbrook. 
comes up to her, holds out his hand, says, great message. And she's thinking about the message of forgiveness. She starts stumbling like, oh, I'm not even shaking his hand, you know. She starts looking around and, and he says, you mentioned Ravensbrook. He said, I was a guard there. When I get out, when the war was over, I gave my life to Jesus. He said, and I know Jesus has forgiven me for all the cruel things that I've done. But I would like to hear it from your lips. He says, will you forgive me? She's frozen, doesn't know what to do. Turmoil on the inside. She thinks, how can this man ask this of me? Do you think just by asking this is going to erase the fact that my sister died a slow and terrible death? Who does he think he is? He can just come in here and ask me that. And though his hand was out there for just a few seconds, it seemed like hours. She was struggling internally. And she's like, I know Jesus tells me to love my enemies. He tells me to forgive so that I can be forgiven. But finally she says, Jesus, I need your help. She says, all I can do is raise my hand. You're going to have to do everything else. So mechanically, she raises up her hand and puts it in his. Something incredible happens. The current starts from her shoulder, flows down her arm and into their joined hands. Then suddenly, this flood of healing warmth flows over her body. The Spirit of God rises up in her. She begins to weep as she's shaking his hand, and she cries out, I forgive you, brother, with all of my heart. And she realized in that moment, she's never experienced the love of God that powerful before. Why? Because it wasn't her love. She tried, she couldn't do it. It was the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through her. Changed his life forever and changed her life forever. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. So who do we love? Answer? everyone we love our family our spouse our kids our parents like that we love our church our brothers and sisters in Christ like that those who don't know Jesus how are they going to taste and see that God is good if we're not the salt and the light and we must represent Jesus well Man, when we love with the power of the Holy Spirit in humility and obedience, the world will know that we are his disciples. And they will know that, man, God must be real because I see God in that person. That's when we can do the impossible. Otherwise, how will they know? Jesus painted the perfect picture of the cross. Let's receive that love for him today. Amen. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we invite you.